Bitch, I'm in the... Hello, my name is Robert Mello. I'm an actor, a member of the Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild. You may know me from such films as The Best of Me, where I play a killer, or the film Crazy Lake, where I play a killer, or perhaps you know me best from the film Happy Death Day, where I play a killer. Possessing such expertise on the subject at hand, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce a titan of the industry, an Emmy-nominated writer who is credited with the genesis of such master works of film as This Little Clod of Dirt, Dust Bunnies, and hold my beer. Born a cancer with a bad moon rising, he likes the color purple, the book, the movies, and the actual color. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Nancy McLaughlin's husband, Tommy. Fantastic. I love <laughs> how that opening happened. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian. With me always on the Talking Shit Show is that guy right there. Um, my name's Mark. Jesus <laughs> Christ. You okay? Oh, I, I, okay. Yeah, I was a little pissed because Facebook started like it cut it. It did its window. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's one of them. I, I was trying. I was trying to make it. Uh, you know, my man. Yeah. Oh, let's see here. S so we had a special introduction from Mr. Rob Mello, uh, yes. who we had on the show, and Rob has introduced Mr. Tom, Tommy, McLaughlin. Yes. McLaughlin. There's no F. I'm not going to mess this up. Yeah, I'm not okay. going to mess this up, I promise. Oh, oh, hold on, wait a minute. Before we do that, yes. Uh, you know, we have, a, uh, we have somebody in our, um, you know, oh, shut up, Steven. Uh, we were, we were talking the other day and, uh, we were talking with, um, you know, this, uh, little podcast called, uh, nonsensical nonsense. Oh, Hey, nonsensical nonsense. Glad to see that you're watching us. Yes, I see. Um, and w we told them we would give them an answer. On After something. the show. What? Hey, you want to do it at the end of the show? So we make show. sure that he's watching the whole time. Yeah, I don't want to okay. break anybody's heart. Then they won't watch us. Oh, you don't. But they're a little podcast. They might. Hey, hey. Uh, so our guest that you have gotten for us today, can yes. you tell me a little bit about him, Mark? Well, he's a director. He's an mm -hmm. actor. Mm -hmm. He's a magician. A writer. A writer. Musician. Yeah. Did you say magician? No, you heard it wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I probably did. I don't know. Any which way, um, he's one of my favorite directors uh, next to, you know, Peter, Anthony. Um, it, those two are, you know, pretty high on my list on uh, directors, writers. Uh, a little movie called, uh, you know, Friday the 13th, part six. And he had to do... Uh, he had to do something that nobody could do or, or nobody. I don't think anybody could have done it the way he did. Uh, he had to bring Jason back to life. He was actually dead in this one. So he had to literally bring him back from the dead instead of, you know, oh, they thought he was dead. Super dope. So I'm going to bring him in now. Perfect. The anticipation. I'm in. <laughs> Tommy, how are you, sir? I'm fine. How are you guys? Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, we want to welcome you to the show. Uh, I'm sorry that the intro took a little bit longer, uh, but Rob Mello, Mr. Mello, cut a fantastic. I feel like that was one of the most 
down to earth promos that you could have done for somebody coming on to not your show. But I mean, he did it for us. And I was like, man, thank you so much. Well, you asked me ahead of time. What's the one subject that uh, I don't want to be talking about? And of course, he brings it up. <laughs> he, said that he, brings it up. He, he said that you would love the intro. Uh, the introduction of course i do you know <laughs> and and the weird thing you know is where he comes up with these state these things i have no idea but that's he, what it was like when we worked together is that mm -hmm. you know we just riffed off each other and it was so much fun you know doing that and and jason the director just let us go and yeah. it you know and, and when i saw like the cut i said be on him more than me he's the he's the star you know he's the actor that knows how to just you know capture your, your imagination with just the little twinkle in his eye and the things he does. He's great. Oh, oh we got Peter Anthony watching. Uh, hey. Peter. Now, like I said, Peter did do one. Um, I'm going to try to play that one in a little bit too. Just I so want to see his new piece of art. I know oh, a laugh. Yes. I, I, I bought a DVD um, or uh, yeah, I, I bought one, but you know, I gotta wait to get it, of course, but I can't wait. I've seen the previews to it, and it looks freaking uh, awesome. Yeah, the preview looks just absolute kick ass. Did well, you I give them any input on it? Not a, not a, peep. not, a, not a peep. <laughs> I, I figured he's he's, he's on his own. As a writer, I fe felt like all the writers stick together. Like, hey, would you read this for me and tell me what I got going on here? If I need a, a different ending, kind of thing. So. Yeah, so I mean th that happens, and I know on the first engines, you know, they wanted, uh, you know, me to read it and have, you know, a bunch of notes and things. And I said, you know, the problem is, is that you guys did such a tribute, you know, to my Jason Lives. If I start kind of talking about that, it feels like okay, well, here's here's what the way you got to do it because it's you know you're paying homage here to to that movie. So I just said, you know when you get to editing, if there's anything I can help with or suggestions, because that's, you know, that's a big part of writing. So when you get down to the bare bones of, okay, what did we shoot and what can we use and what's better without it? And that becomes very hard to be objective. Got it. Uh, Steven says that he loves how Tommy brought Jason back and how he made Jason badass again. So let's talk about that. Like, how did you make Jason badass? Did you do that, or was that, in fact, your your actor doing that? Because I feel like a lot of actors kind of fall into the spot where you want them to, and you're just like, "Holy crap!" Is oh, that a thing? You, you, we, we've talked with oh no, we've talked with CJ Graham. He, come on, uh -huh. he, you look at him. He he helped. Well, I get bring it. Out. I get it. I get it. He's a big dude and all, but I mean, like direction wise. Was there a lot of direction for him or was it like, hey, here's the ball? Well, Don't the great thing, touchdown? Uh, as probably a lot of the, you know, the fans know, I didn't start the movie, you know, with with CJ. It started with Dan Bradley, who was a stuntman, you know, who was playing him. And uh, without me having any feedback, you know, or or opinion on it, Paramount calls me and says, we're sending you a new Jason. It's like, what? Wait a minute. And turned out that, you know, he was gaining weight that was very noticeable, I guess, to them at Paramount. So they just said, we're going with the your second choice, CJ. And I said, you know, well, where's Dan? I got to at least talk to him. Oh, he's gone. He's on a plane. Wow. So you know, to this day, I have not, you know, had a chance to say, I'm so sorry that happened. And yet at the same time, CJ was the perfect choice. And he just being from military he was exactly what i was kind of hoping that we would create a jason that looked unstoppable almost terminator-esque but i never gave him that note i never said no this is robotic or whatever just you know give him an instruction and he would just say yes sir and fo follow the instruction no matter what i mean that was the thing he's he's just so driven to a please and do the right thing and they weren't like commands, but they were suggestions. And you, like you do with most actors, you just hope that they hear what they what they need to hear in that, and then they just kind of pull it 
from you know what their knowledge is. And Jason's not supposed to be thinking, you know, as much as he's just reacting like a good soldier would. You know, somebody shoots at you, you shoot back, you know. So it's, you know, if somebody gets in his way as because he had an agenda in this movie, uh, unlike a lot of the previous ones, you know, he was happy being dead. He didn't need any more of this stuff. Tommy brings him back. So he's going to go after Tommy. Meanwhile, Tommy, of course, that was the worst screw up in the world. So he's got to stop it. So both these guys have a particular agenda, which doesn't get resolved, obviously, till the end of the movie. And then the chick does it for him. You know, <laughs> the, the final girl ends up being the, the one that, you know, kind of helps Tommy out there, which, again, intentional on my part to say, well, sometimes in life, doesn't matter what game you're playing in Las Vegas, you could end up winning on something you didn't expect. And absolutely, that, that would be kind of, again, one of those surprises. But CJ, you know, he knew how to communicate this sense of power. And, um, you know, we borrowed from a few things, obviously, from the shape, uh, you know, Michael Myers, where, you know, he, he looks at the motor home with the tilted head, you know, which is, you know, an animal thing, you know, it's like a dog does when, you know, you mm -hmm. make a dog sound. So yeah, there we are at the motor home. That shot, and if you look I don't know, closely in the background there, you see more of a blue sky than a black sky. Because Was it done um, in the daytime? Sorry? Was that done in the daytime? No, it was done at night. We shot all nights, but we did such an ambitious day. And then, you know, this was very hard to prep. So we didn't kill anybody like the driver. So it took a while before we finally got the, the damn thing to fly. And now we had to do the ending image, which I was really set on because that to me is a very iconic look, which I look at it as the caveman standing on top of the dinosaur. You know, look what I did. Look what I killed. And, you know, he, again, CJ brings that element of, of uh, warrior, you know, to this. And then, you know, having obviously the fire and the smoke and, you know, God knows where Darcy DeMoss, you know, who played Nikki's head is about now since that fell on that side. But she ended up making a comeback, you know, in, in uh, Vengeance, Vengeance 2. Too, right there in the yeah. corner, you know. And I was... Uh, when I found out that uh, Dar Dos uh, yeah. <laughs> Darcy, Darcy, yeah, this, yeah, I can't speak today. Darcy uh, was going to be in Vengeance too. I, the first thing I asked Peter is, I'm like, "How did she survive?" And Peter goes, "You never seen her die. You just oh. seen her face go in there. You know yeah. that was it." So I was like, "Oh, okay." Uh, I but hell, yeah, they they gave her some scars, so you know there was that believability of you know this. She was. You know, it was a while ago that that happened to her. So, you know, whatever she ended up doing in the process, uh, you know, to help herself, you know, heal and get back her, her, you know, her sense of who she was and who she, what she wants to do when she sees Jason again, all that I thought was you know, great choice. Oh, she did. It. She, she was doing awesome in Vengeance too, kicking his ass. But, yeah. you know, yes, words are hard, Glick. <laughs> Uh, so CJ said that he, you let him do his own stunts. And, and so my question, and I don't remember if CJ answered it was what was one of the harder things that, that he had to do or any of your actors, what were, what was any of the, any of the uh, harder parts of the movie that they had to do? Well, yeah, I mean, anytime you do a stunt, there's always the chance that something is going to go wrong. I mean, you plan it out, you do everything you can, you know, and I think our favorite story, both CJ and I are the, the scene where my ex-wife, Nancy Elizabeth is in the Volkswagen and, you know, uh, Darren, you know, uh, uh, Tony Goldwyn had been killed and, you know, Jason looks at her and raises the spear, you know, and, what basically the direction was, we have one windshield, CJ. So we got to make this work. So she's going to be obviously on the on the driver's side. And, you know, when you see, when you lift that up and she starts to move, you just go right for where she was sitting. But as we both kind of realized later, being a soldier as he is, he went for the target. So as she moved over, he moved right with her and jabbed. And I mean... He 
just missed her. Wow. That, that could have been one, one hell of a tragedy, but it, it didn't happen. It was obviously made the shot even more exciting, you know, to see how close it came and things. And, you know, Nancy, I don't even know if Nancy realized how, how close that was. But, it, you know, she had to follow that with being down in the mud and underwater and, you know, being held down there. So that was probably the most difficult thing for any actor, you know, to do. And, and she's not a stunt actor. And she, you know, the scuba thing that they had didn't really help. You know, that good old Georgia clay mud was going down her throat. Oh, yeah. So it was a difficult you know, part of the script to, to, to fill, but do you think I, she had it the, the worst then in, in the film? I, I would say so. Yeah. Okay. Because that was one of those things that was something that normally you would put a stunt person in there, you know? Yeah. Um, and we didn't have it and she wanted to go for it. So like anything else you go, you know, you just hope, pray to God that everything goes all right. Uh, but the cold, I mean, anybody jumping into that water, you know, uh, that was really freezing. I mean, we were all in parkas and stuff and, you know, like the little kids were out there in T-shirts and, you know, it, those things become really hard. And I've learned as an actor myself, um, you probably know this, maybe you don't, that Mick Garris, you know, had me cast in Critters too. And, you know, I get eaten by critters and I'm laying on the ground at four in the morning and it's cold and the ground is like, you know, a freeze, totally frozen. And I'm laying there trying not to shake. And that's one of those things where the body tells you one thing, even though the mind's telling you, nope, you're dead. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. But with all uh, you want to do is shiver. Yeah. So it, it, those kinds of things are difficult for concentration and things for the actors. Um, so then any any of that kind of stuff, you know, Darcy's fight in that small cubicle that we built, you know, that was also fairly intense because she just went with what CJ told her to do, which is just let me guide you, which is what, you know, inherently he knew that stunt language because that's part of what you have to do. You can't fight it. You can't, you know, you just have to trust that he's going to put you where you need to be and that you won't get hurt. And there's probably a bunch of other stuff but I'm not even thinking of because we had, you know, a fair amount of kills in there. And Brian, did you know this was the first Friday the 13th movie that had no nudity in it? No, I did not know that. And what a shame. I, I like a little bit of nudity in a movie. Well, no, Just see, a little I, bit. I, I actually liked what Tommy said. He, he was like, uh, the last time I talked with him, he said that if the actresses or actors did not want to do it. He was not going to make them. Oh, yeah, but, right, right, right. But they do have a picture of Tommy on top of Darcy doing this, you know, covering up. Yeah. It is a great picture. Naked from the waist up, yeah. Darcy did a photo session, and I said, you know, I get so much heat about this, the fact. And she goes, oh, I'm sorry. I said, no, no, you did the right thing, ultimately, because... It's in the script, you know, she's got her top off. But yeah. when we got to the day of shooting, you know, she said, do you really need that? And I said, need it, uh, want it, <laughs> there's a difference. But, you know, are you uncomfortable? She goes, yeah, I really am. And, you know, she goes, and, and I think, you know, if Tom's shirt's off or, you know, or he's got the uh, you know, wife beater on, he looked like he was riding her by, or she was riding him by holding on to those straps of the shirt plus if your you know focus is on her breasts and not mm -hmm. on the comedy that can certainly un, you know undercut what we were trying to do with the scene which was making it funny and that whole thing about you know how much longer you know you know there was, I, there, there was a reason why i brought that one up it's because i i actually have a picture of it. oh there it is yeah <laughs> I look, feel Jason's right I, out there looking. I yeah. feel yeah, CJ. I feel yeah, like uh, I feel like the only reason I I would assume that there would be nudity in the movie is because every other Friday the Thirteenth, because of it being Camp Crystal Lake, is all about having the the teeny boppers with boobies out, and this is getting they're getting frisky and stuff like that. So I kind of anticipated it in the movie. Was I looking for it? Not necessarily, but I, you know, every I think 
as a teenager, well, came, I feel well, like as, everybody is. Yeah, I was going to say, as a teenager, we we both yeah. looking at that. So yeah, of course, but now looking at that movie, it's like, you know, and like I told him, it didn't need it. It didn't. Not at all. Just like just yeah. like Vengeance Two didn't need it. Um, you know, it had the couple in the beginning, but that was about it. I mean, the rest of it didn't need it. It, I mean, they could have stuck a whole bunch in there, but it, I don't think it would have worked out the way it should have. Yeah, it, I just wasn't interested in exploiting the idea. I also, I wanted to make this very different from any of them that came before in, in that the comedy was very important to me. The fact that we were satirizing ourself and, and breaking the fourth wall and having the caretaker look right in the camera with the line about, you know, some folks have a strange idea of entertainment. That really helped us with getting better reviews because it's like, how can you hate something that's making fun of itself? And if I, as I'm beginning to learn is that that movie sort of ushered in that, you know, what was to be sort of the scream world of where you were making a comedy at the same time making a horror movie. And I was offered scream when it was scary movie. And I read the first scene, you know, which the one that Drew, Drew Barrymore ended up doing. And I said, you know, I kind of made this already, you know, as a satirization of the horror movies and the, and the tropes and all that stuff. So I passed on it. And then I ended up getting all these other scripts and none of them were so well written, you know, as, as, as that movie was. So I went back to my agent. I said, you know, is there any chance of, you know, getting into that? He goes, nope, Wes Craven got it. And I went, okay, well, wow. he's great. He's going to do a great job. So uh, that he did do. He did. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I don't know what I would have done that would have been any different or better than what, what he did. He really, I mean, cause he knows, he knows so much about film and it, it just was so great to see how well that worked. Um, but then the irony is years later, I meet Kevin Williamson and we're talking about some project that he had for a TV thing or whatever. And then he said, you know, I, I got to tell you something. Your Friday had such an influence on me writing scary movie, you know, and I went, you're kidding. He says, no, you know, and he's told this to other people too, that, that, that influence. And I said, you know, I turned it down. He goes, you did? And I went, yeah, because I, I saw something I just did and I didn't want to repeat myself. So I said, you know, but the fact that it's done so well, you know, that's great. I mean, it's like you make choices in life and you you hope it's the right one. You know, you, you pick the right woman, you pick the right man, you pick, you know, the right dog, whatever it is that, and you just hope they're going to be a good one. I don't know who that is, but uh, his, what's his up, guys? Name. His name's Eric Smith. Uh, I love and respect Tom. Uh, works on Friday the 13th Part 6, which is my favorite one in the franchise. Sometimes they come back in Vengeance 2. He was also in Vengeance 1. So, uh, let me ask this part. Um, props. As far as the props went, were you given any props to take into uh part six or was this everything that you said you know we're going to start fresh we're going to get new stuff how did that I, work out as you know i had only seen the original friday the 13th which i thought was so clever that it wasn't who or what we thought it might be after obviously Halloween and the whole Michael Myers thing and how many people imitated that whole idea of putting a mask on and killing, you know, the fact that it was, you know, Betsy Palmer and, you know, the mother and that she did these incredibly, you know, violent things. It was such a just great surprise. And the fact that the blood and the gore element was far more intense than, um what would be kind of normal for a lot of these movies and the characters were were fun you know which i also kind of appreciated that there was a sense of humor as there was with the girls in halloween you know i think you really have to balance that thing of don't hate the girls so that the guys are yelling yeah kill that bitch you know to me that's not the point you know it's like hopefully you like them and and you're afraid for them you know you're relating to them so it you know it's it's just that that whole thing of when i came into it i just said you know I, I want to start it in the great gothic style that that i sort of used obviously in one dark night my first film 
So it would have all the stuff. And then what has just come up recently quite a bit now is the fact that I shot it, me and John Cranhouse, who was the DP, to be very contrasty. So if you ever watch it again, take the color out. Just watch it in black and white and you'll see how well it plays in a lot of ways I, for me, better because it's closer to the universal horror movie look, you know, or hammer horror movie look. I never that, even thought of that. Um, so it, it's, it's sort of like the bonus feature, you know, <laughs> that you know, you're not director's that. cut, black and white. Yep. You know, with Guillermo del Toro did that with his uh, Nightmare Alley too, is he wanted to shoot that in, in black and white. And the studio said, all right, well, if you want to do that, we're going to cut, you know, 2 million out of your budget. He goes, uh, never mind. But what <laughs> he did is they lit it in such a way that, you know, they could do a print in black and white later, which they did. I, I'm guessing it's on the DVD or Blu-ray or whatever. But I saw that with, with Guillermo. And, you know, to me, it was even better. I mean, it was just so great to see that movie. And the, the original one, Nightmare Alley with Tyrone Power, my father is in. And like the opening scene, he's a fire eater was a fire eater. So the big blast that you see, you know, that was always the reason I saw that movie so many times is because, you know, dad was in it. So it, it just, how did I get off onto that? Oh, the black and white aspect and yeah. trying to put elements, you know, kids hadn't been done. It was a camp for kids, never had the kids in there like that. And obviously the kills, I wanted to be supernatural. I mean, not something anybody could pick up a knife and slit a throat, but not everybody can take a head, turn it all the way around and rip it off or punch a heart out. So everything was a little bit more unimitatable, you know, which, you know, yes, I do have morals. I'm sorry. You know, I did want to, I did want to ask how that came up. I, I figured that but, you were looking for something that nobody else had done. And I had never seen somebody getting their head twisted off literally like oh, we're going to open this like a bottle cap that was freaking awesome i think i but, think somebody out there probably has there's got to be something somewhere you know where, the, where this has happened you know in, in the many years of where the, the bloodletting even in the 50s of movies that we never got to see um you know where they did just extreme amounts of blood and gore and things but then obviously the mo motion picture rating board stepped in in the 80s and said, you know, you guys know more, you know, you're causing people to kill other people and stuff, which isn't true. I really believe that, yes, if somebody has a fire going on in them, a burning and a rage, whatever, something like this can set them off a little bit more or make them go, yeah, that's what I want to be like, Jason, you know, but to me, that's very rare. You know, these, most of these kills are some form of passion, anger at yourself, angry at the world. And, these movies are really bigger than life and they're kind of a way i think most of us can go on a thrill ride and get really close to it but not necessarily take it home with us you know and then i never thought there'd be this kind of fandom you know 30 what are we going on 36 years now that made this thing and so many people approach me like they just saw it you know this weekend in a movie theater and i just want to tell us how great it is you know and that just absolutely amazes me because you know, I, I didn't think it would still be something you know special to people this many decades you know away. Okay. Uh, the, there's gonna, a there's a show. Are, you want to go to a oh, hold on. break on uh, this? Okay. Yeah. I, and I then I'll come uh, back and I'll ask my well, question. We're gonna we're gonna play a um, a video real quick of uh, of uh, Tommy singing, and then I want uh, Tommy to answer this question from Peter. It's five thirty. It's five thirties over there, <laughs> but here's a here's a video from uh, uh okay. Tom singing Monster Mash. Happy hour here. Yeah, let's get it. Thank you guys. Well, here's a here's an old novelty number. When I was a kid, I loved to do all these voices, and so finally got a chance to do it again. We dragged this out every Halloween. I'm sure some of you guys remember this. Bobby Boris Pickett. The Monster Mash. I 
was walking in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. A monster from his slab began to rise and suddenly, to my surprise, mash. He did the monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. It caught on in a flash. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. From my laboratory in the castle east to the last bedroom where the vampires feast. The fools all came from their humble abode to get a jolt from my electrode. The mash. They did the monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. It caught on in a flash. They did the monster mash. The zombies were having fun. The party had just begun. The guests included the wolfman, Dracula, and his son. The scene was rocking all were digging the sound. Back by his main hound. The coffin diners were about to arrive when their vocals grew. The trip kicked off to the match. They did the monster match. The monster match. It was a graveyard smash. They did the match. It caught on in a flash. They did the match. They did the monster match. Then up from his coffin, Gramps voice in the ring. Seems he was troubled by just one thing. He opened the lid, shook his fist and said, What the happened? My threat to make it twist. Mash. It's now the monster mash. It's a mash. And it's a graveyard smash. It's a mash. It caught on in a flash. It's a mash. It's now the monster mash. Now everything's cool, drank the pop, my man. Monster Mash is the hit of the land. For you, the living, this mash was meant to. When you get to my door, tell the board is sent you. Monster Mash. Then you can Monster Mash. Monster Mash. And do my graveyard smash. Monster Mash. You'll catch on in a flash. Monster Mash. You do my Monster Mash. I fucking love it. I, I fucking love it. it. I did it. Wow. That's a flash. Oh my thing. god, I fucking love that. Listen, watching, I, was, watching I, was already, face... I was already a fan of the song. Yeah, watching your face down it. here though in the corner. We're watching it. I'm watching you do this and uh you know, moving your hands and stuff. It's like wow. But uh Peter had a question. Are the sloths back together and how's the music scene going for you? That's a really good question, because uh, we're right in the middle of a transition here. Uh, first off, that was a group called Allegory, and I was at a yep. you know, a comic convention, and I don't even remember if we actually rehearsed the song or we just said we we're going to do it and just got out there and did it. Um, I think we also did, uh, uh, did we do Teenage Frankenstein and uh, the uh, Man Behind the Mask, or just, I, I can't recall now, but it was just always fun to get out there and do, you know, Boris. When the Sloths began to do it, um, we just made it into a punk song. It went twice as fast, if not faster, which is very hard to maintain the Boris Karloff voice going, you know, from my laboratory in the hostel east to the month. You know, so more of a challenge to do, but, you know, it really kind of kicked it, you know, where obviously that song from that era, you know, it was, you know, much more of a, like almost not quite a ballad, but you know, certainly slow rock. The Sloss, um, COVID pretty much put us in the grave, um, despite the fact that you know our album, which we have actually got vinyl on that as well as just the regular you know CD, uh, it was called Back from the Grave. But we everything stopped, um, and we were in the middle of a tour, and you know that ended. We had a bunch of songs that we were going to you know go for the next album. Everything you know stopped. Then we just maybe how long has it been now? Maybe two months ago uh, at the Whiskey A Go Go on, on the Sun, Sunset Strip, where we started, you know, 
God, 50, 60 years ago or something. No, it couldn't have been 60 for us. The, the club was around that long. Um, they had us come and open for the group Love, who were the biggest group in those days in the 60s when we were still just up and coming punks. So it was great to, you know, kind of pull the band back together again and do this one show. And we then had to kind of see if it looked like everybody wanted to, to keep doing this. And I'm the only idiot, you know, that's like I'm in such death defying mode um, until that, you know, coffin lids and I'm pushed into that crypt, which I already have waiting for me whenever I get around <laughs> to it. But I'm not in any hurry. You know, I keep, you know, I look at 2050 as, you know, okay, that's D Day for me. Or after that, I have no desire to stop anything until I get close to that. Then I'll start going, all right, you know, I've, I've made it 100 years and that's, you know, good enough. And I'm, now it's like, dude, do something really cool now. You know, you've you've got this amount of time, you know, do it. So it, it's a great motivating factor to to go and look at where you're going to be forever, at least the body, um, and say, you know, I got a lot of shit I got to do. So it, as I said, it, it pushed me to the point where I said, okay, if we're not going to, you know, have the group as the sloss, I'm going to reinvent it so that we'll do some of the songs, but we'll also do songs from horror movies pet cemetery uh oh. sympathy for the devil um obviously man behind the mask there's like 50 songs that are really cool song highway to hell you know that i want the band to do and we're i'm making the band into a band called slothzilla so thus i think you can see here there's, there's i see that merchandising ready to go that they that you know, it can be bought in Japan or online because this is like very funny to them, this idea of a of Godzilla, but with a sloth head on it. Um, so I sort of went, OK, that to me works. And I want to put an exclamation point after it. So it's Godzilla, you know, and really do a hard rock. I don't want to say metal, but more in that vein, you know. Of Tommy, that. that's more punk rock than anything that I've seen lately. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's more mm -hmm. punk rock than I've seen anything lately. So, And these are all the influences that, you know, we didn't have. We were a garage band. Yeah. Uh, that was it. And we were basically doing stone songs and animal songs and, um, you know, born to be wild and things that were, you know, in our world at that time. So I, you know, couldn't be phony and do music that it really didn't, you know, live in us, you know, and, so that's the thing now is I'm looking for band members, you know, that want to be part of this mission uh, because I'd love to play the conventions, you know, that like that, what, what you just saw was like a you know, yeah. Saturday night VIP party. Um, but just to be able to go around and say, all right, here's Slaw songs, the ones that I wrote. And then here's obviously the things that are, you know, songs that are great. And if you're into horror and rock and roll, bang, you know, that song works. I know a guy that would probably join the band. You have to Who, know is that? To... Who is that? Who is that? Turn it's your just... phone. You got to turn your phone. No, it's just low lit. I can't see that. <laughs> What's up, motherfucker? Oh, shit. <laughs> he said your lighting sucks. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm yeah. in the garage, so. <laughs> I mean, Tom, you're more than welcome to climb another fucking ladder and throw the second bulb in, but I figured, fuck it, I can see. <laughs> hey, dude, I got drums. I'm just saying, look. Oh, wow. Okay. And a fucking pirate flag. I'm ready to roll. Well, we ladies, and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, special, special guest, Mr. Rob Mello. Rob, how are you, sir? Doing good, my friend. How are you? Good. I, I see you came to say hello to Tommy, and we appreciate that. I think I'm you like it. Or something that's why you're like oh i'm showing up this is happening oh dude he's one of my favorite fucking scene mates i've ever had dude oh, we had a ball it, it was great and i love the fact that they just let us go and we didn't know what we were gonna do until it was over you nope. know yeah well it took a dry it took a dry run to get to get the beats down but yeah. boom yeah i mean i was telling i was telling these guys before you know it, it 
they were, they were trying to set up shots and you know, the poor camera guys were just like the poor steady cam guy was like, not fucking steady. Cause <laughs> <laughs> we had him going. Yeah. I, I threw out that idea. I said, you know, I, I hate, I said, you're going to have rock and roll music playing through this, right? Because that's what we would do. And they go, Oh yeah. I said, then we got to yell at each other yeah. to be here because we got to be, you know, a bit of that dumb and dumber aspect, you know, uh, I'm so only dumb, dude. <laughs> you know, and the fact that we're handling dead bodies and stuff, you know, wrong, wrong guys to be doing this. Nah, nah. It, it, it just pissed me off that we didn't have rum in the budget, you know? <laughs> oh, no, that comes out of your pocket, bud. I know. That's the problem. <laughs> You're like, how much rum does everybody need here? Because I got to go get like two fifths. <laughs> no, nah, we, uh, I, I, I will uh, admit to having partaken the night before and saved the bottle for a set the next day. But uh, yes, we, I, we drank a lot of fucking sweet tea. But uh, <laughs> the night before, so the night before, I'm half cocked out front of the hotel. And I got no fucking idea who Tom is. Uh, the the boss does. Uh, when I when I called her and you know told her, hey, you know I got a got a scene with Tommy, and I got no fucking clue what he looks like. And da 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 da. Who's this fucking ancient hippie walking by me? Anyway, babe, it was fucking Tom. He was, was on the outside the hotel. This is the story you told us that you were outside the hotel on the phone. Yep. 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 Yeah. And I'm like, who the, in, in my mind, I'm, I didn't say nothing out loud. I'm not that fucking rude, but you know, I'm like, who the fuck? Wow. They let all sorts in and it was Tom. And you know, the next day I, all right, Brooks, what's up, man? Yeah. All right. We're on set. All right. That's my scene. Oh, fuck. What's up, man. And <laughs> it, it was just, Tom, Tom's just a great fucking, a great talent, like all around. I, I know a lot of creatives, dude. And a lot of people try to go across genres and across mediums and stuff. And it's not the easiest fucking thing to do, you know? Uh, I think we all start wanting to be actors, wanting to be Frankenstein, wanting to be the Wolfman, wanting to be whoever. And then you sort of go, well, somebody else is better at it. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but I kept begging Jason when they were editing, uh, this thing that, that you know beyond rob i mean he's he's the meat here he's he's the one <laughs> that, that's the actor that's doing stuff i said just you know let, let's just come to me like just staring at him you know that'll be funny he'll say something and then cut and i'm just yeah. like, what the fuck i mean so i mean i did contribute a little bit on that but I, to me it was about you know your humor and, and your charisma which is just great nah man you you just and that, that's that's the great thing about having Tom as a scene partner is because he's acted and he's a director and he understands to let shit flow. Uh, because, you know, I well, look, I'm seasoned salt and pepper. See, <laughs> so, uh, you know, if I just first started out, I'd be very insecure. I wouldn't I wouldn't actually go for everything. And, you know, all the thoughts that I had. Uh, sticking my drawers out my out my uh, pants, for instance. I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta throw some paprika on this fucking guy. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? He took a piss and forgot to zip his fly. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just that simple. You yeah, know? I can't wait. I can't wait to get the DVDs for that and see the outtakes. For you that. haven't gotten the DVDs? No, not yet. Um, Tom, Tom, let's get the fuck out of here. These, these waiting on a guy. Guys. Waiting on a guy. Hey, I'm I'm waiting on. I know uh, it's taking a little while for Jason to find uh, the right people to do it and stuff. So, no, nah, Jay, Jay, Jay's a Jason straight will, dude, dude. Jason will get it done. I'll have him before well, the yeah. end of the year. <laughs> you know, and Mark is diehard. I'm telling you, if, if you guys need anybody for an upcoming project, for the love of God, Mark will do it for free. Just hire him. <laughs> For a 15 minute shoot, he wants to be a part of it so bad. I and God loved, God loved the guy. If I got to fucking pay for it, I'll fucking pay to fly him wherever you need him. You got to tell me, man. Well, that's the great thing about these fan films is everybody's doing it for the love because there's yeah. no money. But the thing that I keep telling people, this is like 
something that's never happened in the history of cinema where the fans have said, you know what, you're not giving us what we want. We love this, so we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to pay for it. We're going to yep. have guys that might have little to no experience, but they want to do it. They've seen enough of them. They kind of know instinctually what's right. And then, obviously, if you get the right actors in, and in our case, you know, giving us that freedom, the whole thing with acting, guys, you know, obviously, as Rob knows, is listening. You know, if you're yep. thinking about your line, you know, it's going to come out false. It's, it's not going to sound yep. organic. But we didn't know what the next thing was going to come out of each other's mouth. <laughs> you know, and then trying to maintain that idea where there is no noise, but you're still going, what? You know, I just said, you know, and to me, that also adds. My nipple itches. <laughs> and I dog, said. <laughs> that little and luckily, Tom's got great fucking comedic timing as well. You know, and it, it, it just, uh, I don't know why or how we just clicked. Yeah. I didn't say but two words to him and was like, hey, man, you want to run lines? He's like, yeah, maybe we should. And I'm going through the lines and we're going. And it just, it felt, it didn't feel uh, legit. You know what I mean? It felt boxed and cagey, if that makes sense. Mm hmm it felt like a uh, prepackaged bullshit is what it was. You have to step outside and be like, okay, well, I like the line, but I want to tell it the way that I need to tell it. Well, this... it, the, the, the notion is what you're fighting for. Every character and yeah. everything you've ever seen is fighting for something. Yeah. So what am I fighting for? I'm in that scene. I was fighting for more booze for him to hurry the fuck up with his shit. So we can drink more booze. Yeah. And I, I agree get more I agree actual fear of Jason's father, you know, CJ. And obviously, if I didn't do what he wanted, I would, you know, get my ass kicked. Or in the case of what you see, putting a knife under my fingernail and then eventually, you know, chopping up my hand. Um, so it's like it was fucking brutal. <laughs> you weren't bothered about that. You were too toasted to give a fuck. <laughs> no, it was cool as fuck, man. <laughs> I did. I did tell him we we had one. Uh, we had one gravestone, and that's it, man. And yeah. it didn't hurt. It like instantly hurt, and that's it. It's kind of like getting a slap upside the head. Yeah, you know. But like it, it like man, we really rehearsed the other loving fuck out of that one little thing. Yeah, you know. And uh, Tom, I'm still holding you to it that when these pencil pushes. Uh, break the fucking break the law or whatever they got to do to get uh friday out of legality i'm holding you to it i don't care I if i'm alive or dead well one way or the other this crystal lake thing is going to happen you know the, i can't the, wait for that they, i'm and, hoping that they do it right we you know i've written Jason Never Dies, which is a sequel to my Friday the 13th, but I haven't been able to do anything with it because of the lawsuits. So then um, I did another thing with uh, uh, James Sweet, who did uh, Jason Rising, which was also a fan film and a very good one. And we did The Diary of Pamela Voorhees. And I went on the, the uh, what do you call it? Uh, I don't know what they, I guess it's just the, the, um Pangoria channel I think it's but I was on there for an hour talking about this film I you know that we wanted to do which started at Jason's birth and went for the next 10 years till they arrive in Crystal Lake because I thought there was something really cool in that well of course <laughs> out comes the announcement a couple of years later that you know this is exactly what Crystal Lake's going to at least start and then go to the camp and then continue on eventually into outer space if the you know the show keeps going <laughs> keep doing what was done before in obviously a different fashion or you know different way of telling the story so you know i've got two jason things here that i can't do anything with at the moment but you know i meanwhile i got another script that i'm gonna you know keep working on that's again different um but it's not something that somebody has the rights to except me so Hopefully that might, you know, finally break break through the wall of getting back in and doing what I love to do. So let's do it. Listen, yeah. guys, uh, I have not written anything, but I, I know in my in in my experience of watching movies and stuff and and wanting to see certain things, 
I am still looking for someone that does mind bending, meaning like you can get in my head, you know what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. and make me feel a certain way. That's the kind of genre that I'm looking for. I, and I want to say horror, but I feel like it's going to be more melodramatic. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, so I'm kind of looking for something like that. So if anybody's in the mood to write something, let me know. I got, I got ideas. Let Brian, I don't let mind Brian know when your Indiegogo is going on. <laughs> I will pitch. I'm in. Let's go. Yeah, I, I mean, not, I not still, everybody's got friends like Brooks. <laughs> I still hold the the Exorcist in that number one position, you know, with Halloween number two, because I was in the fucking theaters, you know, with Halloween first day, you know, with an audience that had no idea what they were going to see, and the, I guess it was like four days into the Exorcist, where people were still passing out, still frozen. I mean, to see all these motherfuckers not get up when the credits were rolling, they were shocked. <laughs> They were so messed with, and they didn't have to be a religious person, but boy, a lot of people went to church after that. Oh, yeah. You know, the, Linda Blair's performance and the makeup, all of that was, that whole thing was so orchestrated by Freakin in such a brilliant way that people just had no idea how much of a mind fuck that was. So, I mean, there are the ones that kind of tap into it. I don't think they had any idea that it was going to work. Tom, did you see the, uh, I think it's the director's cut with, where she's going down the stairs backwards. Oh yeah. Yeah. That fucking tripped me out. Oh, <laughs> and I told the fellas and I'm going to get off here soon in, in a sec, but the, uh, none of that shit trips me out. None of that shit trips me out. Dolls, you know, fucking zombies, nothing. What trips me out, what scares the ever loving shit out of me is people. You motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> you motherfuckers are capable of some of the most evil minute. shit that we can't even think of. And we're pretty fucking imaginative. <laughs> you know that you know that every every day you leave your house, one in twenty nine people that you walk past is a serial killer. Yeah, if I live in a fucking major city, I live in rural ass Indiana. If I meet fucking twenty nine people in one day, I peopled way too hard, dude. <laughs> well, they all could be Texas Chainsaw fight folks too. Hey, hey man, listen, you never, I'm, I'm, you never know. I tried, I tried to be a super guy. huge fan of Texas Chainsaw, and and everybody keeps saying, "Well, the franchise is never going to be rewritten and stuff like that." Somebody needs to rewrite it. You know, no. we're ready. We're yes, absolutely. No. We're ready. No, I, 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 to me, I think that they, they keep screwing it up every time that they try to do it. Yeah, I mean, like this latest one. I mean, the kills were great. Oh, I, I but, wasn't a, I wasn't a fan of you know him going on the bus and killing all those people. You know, nobody could get out. You know, Mark, I, Mark's I supposed found to say to spoiler get, alert. Oh fuck that! If you oh well, seen fuck it, them yeah. if they haven't seen it by now. <laughs> yeah, it's been out for a long, for a while. I mean, my my point is, you know, the characters, you know, the the main the principals. I wanted them to die within like ten seconds of meeting them, and yeah. that's not how you write. That is not a good thing. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. So that we, you know, when when the fucking the payoff, the bus came. I'm like, fuck yeah, carve them up, baby. I'll take a half a pound of roast beef while you're at it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was great. I mean, it was great at, uh, how that was orchestrated. But I mean, I figured at least more than two people would get off that bus. Instead, only two people got off. Well, I mean, you know, there there's that that mob mentality, the fear. You know, uh, you you ever been in a big crowd when gunshots rung out? You know, it's yeah. fucking pandemonium. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going in. Uh, I guess it'll be three hours from now to see Abigail. Uh, oh, that, this is, a, that, this is the new flick, right? This is yeah. Yes. That's coming actually out tomorrow. But they do these, you know, these sort of preview screenings to try to get some numbers in early, so they know how much more they're going to, you know, put into the publicity. And thank God I've got a girlfriend, Laura, who loves this shit more than me. And so if I say, "Well, there's like an 11:30 screening," we let's go. I mean, she's out the door before me. So, you know, every Thursday, if there's anything opening that's in that in the genre, you know, we're there. 
you know, nice. with the rest of the mud people. You know, it's like, yeah, come on. <laughs> and what well, I hate, make sure make sure you're giving people your honest opinion on it too. I mean, because they're gonna respect I'm, your honesty. It it looks good. It does. But, it does look good, but I but, I think that we're gonna fall into a point of disappointment because I think that the parts that you see in the in the in the previews, I think that that's all you're gonna get. I could, um, uh, unfortunately, I never know. But Tom's not a bullshitter, so okay. Yeah, they're, you know, they're juggling comedy and horror, and yeah. as I know, you know, you again, if you like the people, you kind of go with the vibe. Um, if you don't, then you're sitting there going, you know, come on, cut off a head, do something, you know, <laughs> be funnier. Yeah. But if they can blend it well, when good actors, and you know, it always gets down to that. Good actors, you know, somebody that you can relate to, connect to on some level, um, yeah. that they're being true, true in the way you understand what reality is. You can do anything. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, uh, guys, just, uh, real quick, uh, 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 so we were on a uh, we were watching a show yesterday called Nonsensical Nonsense. It's another podcast, and uh, something got brought up briefly, and it was somebody seen something on Facebook, and it was me, by the way, uh, Fred, uh, a ten part series that is supposed to be done by Rob Zombie, which is a story about Freddy Krueger. Uh, does anybody know any truth to that or how would you feel? How do you feel about it? Do you think that this is a story that needs to be out there? Well, I, I didn't think that, uh, you know, Chucky would have been a good series when they brought it out, but they did. And I mean, at least the original creator and all of them are all involved. This one, well, I don't think it ain't. It's not, but I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot if it's actually true. Yeah. It's so hard to know. It, it's it's just, you know, you can make something seem like it's an absolute real event by just kind of leaking it online. And somebody goes, have you heard about this? And it's, if somebody's got the money and the wherewithal, it's like, well, let me check into that. No, that, but that's a good idea. We should do that. You know, you never know. You really, it's it's so hard to know because where do you, you know, what's the source? You know, how do, how do they hear this? Because, you know, this town's very, very quiet. Uh, I had no idea that this, you know, Crystal Lake thing was going to actually happen that. And I talked to Victor Miller. I later talked to Sean Cunningham as well. But, you know, Victor had a lawyer, you know, who's very powerful. He got, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, we know. Yeah. NBC <laughs> and Universal and, you know, A24. I mean, but did anybody else know? I know. And I know a lot of people, you know, on the inside track of this. And it's like. Yeah. Trying to keep a secret, they did it very well. You didn't know? Oh, mm -hmm. Rob saying dude, I knew last year, dude. Hmm? I'm fucking lying, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that I knew. Would you say I know? I knew last year. Yeah. Oh bullshit. <laughs> that, that, that's the humor. So, so the 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 show's gonna happen. Camp Crystal Lake is gonna happen. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it probably will happen. What next year? It'll come out. Do is you there... guys feel that they will reach out to any previous, or, or excuse me, any past cast members, past writers, directors? Is that gonna happen? Yeah, I think that's the whole one of the things Brian loves. I mean, because he's you know he's already bringing um, what's her face uh, from the first one, uh, but just her blank, and she's wonderful, uh, Adrian King. She's already in there, and people are speculating. Oh, is she going to be Pamela Voorhees? What What are they going to do with her? Yeah, kind of thing. But yeah, you know, they're definitely going to do it. But I'll tell you, if, if you want to know the Hollywood secret here, um, yes, they settled on the rights that you know. Oh yeah, Walter's supposed to get the, uh, Walt. Yeah, uh, Walter Miller. Well, what? <laughs> Damn, the blanket. Victor. Victor. Victor Miller. Um, and Sean have basically, I don't know, he's going to do the, the mass Jason, the, the, you know, Victor's going to do the pre prequel and the movie. It's six o'clock. But that didn't happen, you know, and both there's still stuff that they both have to sign off on if one's going to do this or that, which all they have to do is go, nope, mm -mm, more money. Nope. That sucks. And they, they've got, you know, because when I talked to Sean, and I said, I have the script, man. I, you know, I would love to send it to you to see what you think. It's, you know, it, it hasn't been done quite like this before. 
And I went out of my way to sit in the theater in my mind and go, all right, if I'm watching a Friday, what do I want to see? What have the fans told me for the last 30 years they want to see? And tried to put it all in there. And basically, Sean was like, you know, man, it used to just be me. And people did what I said. It's like, it's not like that. There's, there's all these other elements that are now part of all this. I mean, you could send it. And I can, you know, kind of, but I thought, you know, I don't want to send it to him now. He's basically into you know, a very dark, fatalistic thing about, you know, the whole Friday idea, because there's so much, as I said, baggage now that there's so many hands in that pie. And it's a money. That's one of the things, Tom, that my, my wife, I call her the boss, obvious reasons, but she is a Friday super freak. She knows literally everybody. She's met you probably a half a dozen times, hmm. but like, Watching it, she hates Friday uh, fan films, uh, but she watched Oz for obvious reasons. And uh, she was like, holy shit, that was really fucking good. Like, it hit all of these points. Uh, I'd go get her, but she would yell at me later <laughs> and put me well, back. She's half cave. naked, so. Well, uh, she would she would put me back in the cage and shit. I don't want to go back in the cage. Come on, animal. I would like to see that though. I bet you would. Yes. Fucking freak. Right. You in a cage. <laughs> Dirty bad. Um, before you get off here, um, are you still um, are you still a go for the military show? I can't even see him anymore. He's out. He, he's done. Say what? Are you still good for the military show? At the Which, end of the month? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are yeah, you dude. sure? Are you good? Shoot me a reminder, dude. You got yeah. your uniform? I'll, I'll, I'll remind you. No. Ah, he's Brian, not ready. Do, he's Brian, not ready. you have yours? I got a pair of coveralls. I'm going to look like Jason without the mask. Uh, I've got, it, listen, uh, it, it, well, I'm a, I'm a Marine, so, like, I... Don't look like, well, I, I look relatively close to what I did. Closer than a lot of my compadres. I will tell you fucking that, you <laughs> bunch of fat bastards. But uh, Marine Corps dress blues are very, they're uh, tailored to you. And you have to stand like this. Yeah. When you're, you're, you're 18, like so. Not a lot to breathe. You're not allowed to breathe. That's why, no. the, that's why the brain cells of the Marines are kind of but one. Surprisingly. Sure. All right there, pinky dick. Slow your roll. Uh, but surprisingly, you can do the donkey butt like a motherfucker. <laughs> uh, there like are it. two. There are going to be two military shows. There's going to be our show, which happens on what's the date? Uh, the twenty fourth. And then the, we'll carry that show over because, unfortunately, for us. Uh, Rob, unfortunately, when it gets to being a lot of military guys talking, uh, these hosts that they have, they don't get to ask any questions or anything like that. So, I don't plan on uh, any questions. so they made it a two-parter, and the other half of the show will be played on nonsensical nonsense. And if you were up for it, they would like to have you on that show as well. Sure. There you go. Uh, there you by go. the way, Tom, uh, I know a couple of. Uh, Show promoters in the Midwest, do you want me to forward your number? Sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get back on the con thing again because it's like my my dance card is completely empty for the rest of this year <laughs> going at any of these cons. But, you know, I think what happens is other people start to become popular. And then some of the people that are so good, like CJ, at getting themselves in, you know, I, he's just... I mean, this man's brilliant, you know. And well, C CJ married Ruby. Uh, let, let's not bullshit. Uh, CJ married up. <laughs> <laughs> he might be loaded, handsome, tall, and fucking famous and shit, but he married up, baby. <laughs> well, she's great. No you know, I was super nervous to interview him because, it, like, he just had his presence on screen was he felt like he took up the whole thing and i was like yeah. if oh, i ask a question and piss this man off he is coming through the screen and he's gonna get me he's a big son bitch but he's, 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 he's hey. a night he's a super down-to-earth nice guy and, and that's all you guys like you have you don't understand the amount of enthusiasm 
in the amount of um, a lot like we talk about you guys. I go to work and I'm like, dude, I have a show tonight that I'm doing with Tommy. And, you know, I did it with you, Rob, you know, and everybody's like, who's Rob? Oh, let me show you this video. Oh, let me show you this movie. Right. <laughs> so then it's like, oh, yeah, we're watching. We're watching tonight. This is happening. OK, cool. Yeah. Thank you. And then everybody right. left as soon as I said that, you motherfuckers. You Eddie back from CJ for one minute. He comes from the casino world. I mean, yeah. he ran casinos. Yep. That's serious yep. money, and that's serious smart. You know, so yeah, you know, he's gar he's grounded in that. You know, that world um, that he just knows how to take ten cents and make it into you know ten dollars. I mean, he's he's amazing in all those ways, and to see to watch his mind how it works, and then he's also going to be hysterical. At you know, like slapstick hysterical, like in a restaurant, you know, just straight up. He just you know has this gift. Yeah, he's one he's one hell of a of a guy. Oh, he's, he's a fucking oh, yeah. weed high dude. He he we we all went out for uh I think it was Midwest Monster Fest. And we all went out for breakfast. Uh like me, him, Chris, Corey, uh from uh Living yeah. Color, the lead singer. Yes, I fucking fanboyed. Fuck you. <laughs> and fucking, I was just like, I looked at Corey. I'm like, holy shit. You know, after I got done with my fanboy and I'm like, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. But I'm six feet, dude. You were this monster and you're, that's all right. That's cool. <laughs> but like the next, you know, next day. Fucking first thing, CJ was out there. Y'all ready to go to breakfast? I'm like, no, man, I'm fucking hungover. He's like, yeah, yeah, he eat it off. Boom, never saw a check. Yep. Fucking sweetheart of a guy, man. You yeah. know, and and he does for the fans, left and right, left. Oh and right. yeah, amazing. But I'm gonna I'm gonna roll out, Tommy. I'm holding you to your fucking promise. We're gonna work together. You know that. You damn right we have. Got it. Ah. Uh, Maybe if you'll direct something, you'll hire me and I can, you know, do a bit part. I'm, I'm yeah. good at this. No. Oh, I, I want Rob's you to figure out how to make the killer this time. Rob plays the killer all the time. It's somebody else's turn. But he's so good at it. He is really good at it. That's what my ex-wife said. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Tom, it was great fucking seeing you, brother. Great seeing you, man. Rob, you know thanks what? for coming on and, and, and giving him some shit. So we appreciate it. Brian, you know, it was really funny. He couldn't see shit, but he heard me say, what's up, motherfucker? And he boomed. <laughs> he was like, God damn it. <laughs> well, under your picture, it says Joe. So they did I know. Too. I did that on purpose. Because <laughs> oh. you're old and, you know, you're he old. Was in, he was going to come in blank and just start talking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But he got tired of waiting. He's like, nope, I'm not waiting no more. This is happening. anyway. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you guys so much. In a few weeks. Uh, thank Tom, you, Rob. I'll see you later. All right, man. Well, Sorry that took up so much of your time. I apologize, Tommy. But we no, no, that right. was a That's... that was a special surprise that we wanted to give to you. Uh Rob. But I do have I do have one more video though for him. Oh, okay. Oh, and this is from uh, uh, this is from Peter. Hey everyone, Peter Anthony here, writer director. I just want to tell everybody: make sure to check out the Talking Shit podcast, April eighteenth at eight PM, where the guys will be interviewing one of my favorite people of all time, my good friends, the legendary Tom McLaughlin. Make sure to turn in April eighteenth at eight PM. I'll see you there. And he was absolutely here the whole time. So, Peter, thank you for for He's the uh, man. You know, oh, I, you know I, I look when, I, when he looks at you like that. It's like, what do you want me to do? Okay, I'm there. <laughs> He's got a I, great intensity when he focuses like that. It's great. Yeah, he was um, he was dealing with a laugh at the time when I had asked him, and he was having a few problems with the you know stuff going on. And I was like, man, you, you don't have to. I mean, but he did it anyways. So I, I was happy. Um, I love talking with Peter. He he's a great guy. He's down to earth. He's wonderful. Yeah, it's like there's no challenge that he won't take, which is what I think is so amazing. So many people say, "Well," and I do this with actors too. It's like, no, my character would only do this. I mean, he would react. It's like 
we all do shit we never thought we would do when certain things happen, certain circumstances. We all lie like motherfuckers. If something, you know, you go and you see a movie and it's like, it's, oh yeah, you directed, hey, how are you, man? Yeah, yeah. Was, you know, and if you hear the word interesting, you know you're in trouble because they can't say good or bad. They said, you know, it's really, it's really interesting. Yeah, you know. And that was really bad in the days where, you know, I knew the people like in plays and you'd have to sit there through a play going, oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? <laughs> but again, we, we, we pull ourselves up and we do things that, you know, we ne never thought we'd do. And it's the same thing as I try to convey to actors. And Peter's one of those guys where he's had such a unique road that he's gone down, you know, on, and the things he's accomplished. And, you know, he's still young and got a long way to go. So I'll be excited and, to see what the next and what's is. great about him is he he loves the feedback and i think that that's why he does these shows he he comes on our show he he taught he watches our show and he talks he listens to what direction i think you know i i think he's really good at taking direction and he knows okay well if if tommy tells me that this is gonna work or not gonna work i think he's gonna listen a little bit more because you've been doing this for how long now please um, well, I guess you have to say what, what I, I started making movies mm -hmm. when I was seven in the back Ooh. lots of MGM studios with a little eight millimeter camera on the weekends when there wasn't anybody else there. So, you know, we were shit. I mean, we were kids. We didn't know what we were doing, but we'd make these things, but the sets were incredible because <laughs> you're on the back lot of, you know, a real working movie studio. And I actually stole a director's chair one of the old school ones that are much lower and it said John Sturgis on the back. And I had no idea that this was, you know, who this was at that time. Um, and I still have that chair today, you know, it's, it's oh director on, on one side and John Sturgis on the other. And I finally met him years later at a seminar. And, you know, I said, I got a confession, sir. I, I took your director's chair. I think you were doing ice station zebra back then. And he looked at me for the longest moment and he goes, is that where that fucking chair went? Uh, and, I, and, he goes, and he goes, no, shit. If it helped you, you know, I go, yeah. Can, can you give me some piece of advice? Just some some director piece of advice, you know, since I haven't done this yet. And he thought about it. He said, yeah, wear comfortable shoes. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that's the thing. And, and like, I remember Spielberg said, what, what's the hardest thing about directing is getting out of the car in the morning. Because now you got to face all the ideas and all the stuff that we have to face, you know, and you have to kind of love, you know, the, the unknown. And when something goes bad, it's like, no, no, this can be good. You know, you, it's like you have to keep taking what's negative and make it into a positive some way, somehow. Um, and a lot of the biggest mistakes that happen on movies end up being something brilliant, you know, that occurs. And why happy, we call those happy accidents. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You lose Have a particular you... actor and you go, no, 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 no. They're the only one that can play this role. And you get somebody it's like, I don't even heard of them. What is it? And they come in and they just, they nail they it. Kill yeah. yeah. Biggest expectations of what this part could have been. Um, have, have you ever had to like, let somebody go from a film because they wanted to, they want to take your spot. Like, um, I'm not saying it per se, like they want, but they're giving you direction. Like, Hey, this is what I want to do. Oh, I've had a few. Yeah. And usually it's actors who are just dying to direct themselves. They, you know, they're very close to possibly getting that. So mm -hmm. it's sort of them kind of trying out that power, you know, and I'll listen to anybody. I mean, I, I really am very open because, you know, we're, you know, we're looking at the trees and somebody else can stand back and see the forest and, and might come up with something, you know, you know, if you do this, that's, then that's, might be even better and if it's a great idea i'll go out of my way to let everybody on the crew know best fucking idea i've heard period and and this is like the craft service guy you know and i try to keep that as open of a forum as possible and if something isn't right it's like you know that's a great idea but it's kind of not the way i'm you know the vision i'm trying to go with this but don't stop giving me ideas because you know i i love when somebody can see something i didn't see and it is a collaborative art form and it should be looked at that way. It's our movie, not my movie. It's our movie. And once everybody realizes that, then, you know, then they really own it. And it's, it's wonderful to have that sense of, you know, community. 
I, I, I've never been in film. I've never done stage or, or anything. But I think, uh, you know, listening to uh, how people direct me when I was in the military, mm-hmm. I, I feel like if you're giving me that same kind of direction, I'm going to take it and I'm going to run with it. But I won't put a spin on it until you tell me to put my own spin on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't know. Because with Rob, because Rob was prior military as well, I, I want to yeah. know if that's how his went. Was, he was able to take the direction, but then he was like, and then I could put my own spin on it. it, it the military really, you know, as the, the older I get and the more things I do in directing, the more I get <clears throat> how valuable that can be is don't think, just do what you're supposed to do. Period. Because yeah. as soon as you know, you know, analysis creates paralysis comes in, and it's very hard. Like writing scripts now, because I'm going, okay, this is great, this is great, and I look at the next day, I go, who wrote this? A monkey? What the? F-? You know? And I'm, I, it's like, leave it alone, keep going, don't go backwards to fix things. But you start to know too much. Where when you're younger and you just do, you know, okay, this thing's due in one week, okay, and, and you just do it. You don't overanalyze it and stuff. So it, there is something about that whole military thing is he tells you this is what you got to do, you do it, and you get used to that. Get rid of the ego. And as an actor, as we do in life, I don't know what the hell I'm going to say next. I'm just, you know, trying to get out a feeling. But the ble- the more emotional I get with it, the more phony it is because we don't in life. So much of directing to me is like just say this like it's a fact. You know, it's far more frightening to have somebody go. I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> Did you hear me? I'm going to fucking kill you. You know, no, I'm going to kill you. Don't know, you know, <laughs> warming up to it. It's just a fact, you know, you know, and then, and then like Liam Neeson's so great at that, you know, and then yeah. I'm going to kill you again in hell, you know, and it's, there's something you. With comedy fucking kill you. Yep. Yeah. And uh, when I learned that and started doing all these true crime, movies I was doing for for TV, you know, it was so different when somebody just made it like, this is a good thing that I'm doing. You know, I'm getting rid of somebody that's really going to make everybody else's life horrible. So kind of look at myself as a hero by chopping her head off. You know, I mean, and I talked to inmates on death row about what they thought about when they were killing or whatever. And it was amazing, guys, how many times somebody would say, well, I guess my grandmother, you were thinking, it's like thinking what she was going to think. And wow. I just, I couldn't stop that from happening. I still was programmed to do what I was doing, but yeah. Uh, and other times it was like, you know, one of the ones that bothered me the most was an HBO special about teenagers who kill. And there was one kid who killed his best friend's mother. And the, the person said, you know, what were you thinking of when you were, killing his mother. And he said, well, I just sort of thought of myself as Jason. You know, I just had no emotion. I just, you know, did it. And I'm going, no, 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 no. Because they cut to my poster, part six. And I'm going, that's, that's the very thing I argue is not right. You know, we, I don't, I, this kid already had issues, but that sort of was like, the, you know, the wardrobe we got to put on and feel empowered. Um, yeah. So there's so many different versions of that kind of stuff that happens in life, you know, listening to a Rob Zombie song isn't going to make you go out and do what he's singing about, but they certainly tried to hang it on him, you know. I I, I think that they, there's a whole lot of that that goes around, oh, I blame it on this, I blame it on that. Mm -hmm. Don't blame any of that, because you didn't, you weren't watching the movie when you were doing it. Yeah, You watched the movie and then you went and did it because you want to be that guy? You're not that guy. You're no. not. You're, well, you're, we right. all look for things to justify our actions, whatever it is. You know, I'm not going to tell her I love her because she's going to get too clingy. She's going to be, you know, and it's like you start overthinking things and then you just end up messing them up. And then there's other times where, you know, you just put too much weight, you know, on a particular decision and then you don't do it. And then you find yourself, you know, 20 years later in a bar going, you yeah, know, I put up in. Why didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't I? You know, Mm -hmm. like the famous thing of the quarterback in there that his greatest moment was that, you know, senior year, you know, when, when, when he did that touchdown that no one believed no one could catch him. But 
he never got past that. I mean, that's the story. So because he got because he got the girl pregnant. I mean, that's normally the it's <laughs> normally the what happens. Yeah, that's I Mark's mean, outcome. This is uh, it's a, you know I mean my girlfriend that I'm with now she got pregnant at 16 and you know when I hear the story and stuff I think wow you know I wonder how that happened well her mother was 14 and wow. you know it it's like where's your teenage days where's your you know that growing up in that thing it's like no now you're a mom and you got to do that it doesn't make you a bad person it's just it was something that happened and you know nobody wanted to do any kind of a obviously abortion or anything it's just you know look you did it this is the result and you, you deal with it and there's so many somebody out there that might regret it years later but then there's a lot of people that just go you know this is the greatest thing that happened to me you know my world yeah. is just so full now having that and now i'm a grandmother or whatever so but, mark mark and i have uh have been with our significant others for more than 20 my mine will be mine uh on the 29th of this month will be 24 years uh married 26 all together Good. That's and, really good, man. And, and I'm right there with you. So, uh, but you know, we do. I'm sure. I don't know. I don't know if Mark does it, but I'm sure that we're like, oh, you know, if I wonder what if I didn't marry her? What if I didn't? I think yeah. I'd be a scumbag. I, I mean, I, I'm a bigger scumbag than what I am right now. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I I wonder sometimes, like, would I've been a good person? Because I feel like she did. Her, her job to make me a good person mm -hmm. my so, my wife made me a better person yeah yeah better person it's true uh, but, you know if you if you marry the right person you know or you're best friends with somebody that you just go i wish i was as good as they are but you know what mm -hmm. i love this influence you know makes me think you know there there are people that aren't as fucked up as me but you know what was a huge turning point for me guys was was going to al anon meetings and listening to these stories of people that lived with alcoholics or going to AA, you know, I don't drink myself. I never have, you know, or, you know, smoke. But when you hear people's stories just flat out, of, you know, things that have happened, it's mind blowing, you know, the human condition and what it can do and not do or regret. And it yeah. made me come to a point where I said, you know what, I can look back at all these mistakes I made. And if somebody said, would you do them again? knowing now what you know and i go yep because the truth is you can't undo what you've already done you just have to accept it and accept it as that's what i felt was right at that time you know i and i i had fun making the mistakes i mean they were fun at the time but you know that's why i had to stop drinking because it was too much fun for me yeah I, it got me in trouble it will <laughs> one way or the other, you know, it will. And I've, I've lived around, you know, of course I'm Irish Catholic, ultimately, you know, you're born with the bottle, you know, and I've lost so many people, so many family members and stuff. And you just have to, you can't change them. They have to reach a point where it's like, you know what, I'm done. That's it. You know, and it's wonderful when that occurs and there's other people that just go through it. And, you know, I mean, the sixties watch, um, uh, the Monterey Pop Festival, the documentary. There's like four times in that movie they cut to the audience, and here I am, <laughs> front row. Hendrix, you know, uh, the Who, Otis Reddy. I mean, the 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 cream of rock and roll and music yeah. at that time. Huge influence, and you know, we were all stoned. I mean, that was it. And the weed wasn't like it is today, <laughs> or a couple of hits, you're good. You know, you're smoking, you know, a bag of that stuff, you know, to get some sort of reaction. So it, it, you know, I had that period, and that was, you know, at a certain point, I went, this isn't going to help me get to the next step. You know, if I keep just, you know, chilling, you know, and and just thinking about, you know, nothing and listening to music and not moving. So it, you know, still held on to the music, but the other lifestyle had to go away. My wife said that she wished she was uh, around in the 60s. Uh, she thinks that she'd be a better person or the person that she is now, because I think that she's absolutely fantastic. So, uh, but she feels like she could have been around in the 60s and, and 
really ruled I life. Just, uh, I could just herself, imagine you your know wife I mean? in, in the sixties. That would have been interesting. She's a she's a flower child, dude. That's oh, I, mean, I, that's I know. One. That's why I said it would have yeah. been interesting. So. Yeah. Well, we really thought we were changing the world. You know, all the stuff mm -hmm. that the repression from the fifties after the war. Everybody was promised. You know, you're going to get a house. You're going to have this. You know, the wives get out of the workforce, make babies, take care of the house. You know, there was a real thing there that 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 made a lot of people very very angry and restricted. And we came into this thing, you know, and the combination of obviously the Beatles and their influences and just the music in general becoming so unique and different and, you know, Motown, you know, compared to country, compared to hard rock. I mean, so all this stuff was like, this is great. You know, we're in a great era. Um, and, you know, then that sort of kind of disappeared in the 70s and things. And the 80s were, again, a very unique period where I know as a filmmaker and all the filmmakers I knew, it's like, you know, we're making shit here. This is just candy. It's nothing. You know, 70s, look at that. The stuff that influenced us, The Godfather and The Exorcist, and yeah. Jaws. I mean, all these, you know, great, great films. And, you know, we're but now, you know, the, the 80s are looked upon by, my God, you you were part of all that. And then how great was that? And it's like, at that point, you didn't think about that other than we wanted to make it bigger and better. So, yeah. but now I'm, I'm just have to say, you know, everybody's period, you know, somehow they're a part of that. And however they look back on it, you know, can change when people are coming up saying, you know, I just loved every aspect of that. I didn't think, really? Okay. Well, most but, people like the 80s, um, especially the horror in the 80s. They they mm -hmm. love that genre right there because it gave you Jason. It gave you Freddy. It gave you more of Michael. It gave Listen, you something that nobody yeah. ever talks about. Skin, Skinner. Scared the bejesus out of me. Go <laughs> If you don't know what I'm talking about, yeah. go find it yeah. and watch it. Skinner. Yeah. Skinner yeah. I haven't seen that in a long time. Yeah, that's that's fucking scary. We so. need to sit down and watch it one day. Yes, I'm, uh, <laughs> I was a child, and we went to the drive-in movie theater. Oh and yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. This guy, this guy was putting people in dog kennel kind of things, cages, you know, and then cutting them up, eating them, kind of. Uh, no, out. out. Uh, and now you know how I feel out. about Freddy. Okay. <laughs> I lived on Nightmare our Nightmare on Elm Street came out. I lived on Elm Street. I was Ooh. seven years old, six, seven years old. And, well, come on. You, you would think the same way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, we're all made different, but we're all the same when it gets down to it. You know, what it, what is it that scares us? What is it that makes us laugh? It might be different depending on our background, but... Sure. I remember, you know, when I got a PG for, for One Dark Night, my first movie, we were so upset. We thought, oh, this has got to be an R with all the, you know, pus and blood and maggots and all this stuff. And it gets a PG. So parents were taking their kids. Grandparents were taking the kids, you know, to go see. And, of course, not a whole lot happens in that movie and because it's very old school, like the movies that I remember growing up on. It took a while before something really took off. But when it took off, it scared the hell out of so many kids. I mean, they come up to me and say, you know how much you traumatized me? Or that Alice in Wonderland that you were in, you were the Jabberwocky. I slept under my bed for a week. That friggin' Jabberwocky you did was, I go, really? That, that bothered you? Oh God, yeah, you have no idea what that would do to a six-year-old, you know, and little Alice. And it's that thing of connecting as a child to something that um, was traumatic, you know, because yeah. it was so out of your world. That's like, holy shit, where does that fit? Fuck you, Glick. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but okay. Uh, Tommy, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Uh, we ask you for an hour and you ask more than an hour. Yeah, we've, uh, done, I, boy, we've done an hour and a half. Okay. You, um, we've done an hour and a half. Um, and I, I do have a question. The camera that you're using now, what mm -hmm. is that called? This thing because it's it's floating with you. It moves. Six thirty. Yeah. It does. Yeah, it does all kinds of crazy shit. It's called uh, Obot. Obot. O b o d. Yeah, because I mean, if I get up and start to you know walk around the room, it you know yeah, hang, it's gonna follow you. That's really cool. So um, 
yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to go up to the horror museum that I've created upstairs here, but I've not properly lit the thing yet. So it would be hard to see a lot of the, the things that are in there. But, you know, Jason's coffin is obviously the centerpiece of that. that Listen, movie. if you ever want to, if you want to ever entertain anybody with that, you are more than welcome to bring it to the show. Okay. Stop in yeah. anytime. Hey, shoot us a message and be like, Hey, I, I just want to, I just want to do a walk around in the room. Okay. We would absolutely love for oh, hell yeah. our viewers and our fans, your fans to see that. Cause I, I think I'd be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fine. Yeah. Awesome. I, it's like, I, I put it together, not well, of course for myself, cause I'm living out this childhood fantasy that I had, <laughs> but um, for other people to go, whoa, you got that? Or, oh my God, that thing moves. You know, it, it, you know, I love that element of, of surprise and excitement that certain things, especially the stuff that, you know, we're all involved with, just really gives you all this, you know, burst of, of dopamine. And I mean, it's just, you know, it's the adrenaline that's like, oh my God, oh my God, this is going to be great. And then when it isn't, of course, you know, we're the worst critics too. About yeah, oh, it just it sucked, and they could have done this. They could have, but you know, movies can do that to people. See, I like uh, this is a three D printed uh, Jason. Really? Yeah. And the guy that oh, his head comes off anyways, but I'll show it this way. His um, mask comes off, and his head comes off. Yeah, his head. How about that? Comes, yeah. Let me do it this way no he done broke it i don't know if you can see that yeah i can see it wow it, yeah. it's really good i wanted them to make a uh a, a, a freddy with uh or a, a jason with a freddy's head right in his hand and the guy the guy's looking into it for me that's great but he made this i got a uh a freddy up there and uh ghost face so so mark this this jason that you have what film is he from which part uh three part he's three. from three okay yeah. when does by, when does jason tell. i was gonna say when does he start to change part six i mean he dies in part four yeah. but right. part six he you know he uh that's when he changes and, and and real quick, why did you make those changes, Tommy? Did, did you look at part four and say this is what he needs to come back as? Or yeah, part four is my favorite personally. You okay. know, I I thought Joe Zito did a great job. And when oh, you yeah. sit there and you, I was in a screening room at Paramount, and we started with one, two, three, just right at one after the other. And you know, when I got to four, I went, "There's some good filmmaking in here." I mean, it it's certainly still gory and all the elements and things that you come to know. But I think the fact that they were thinking it was going to be the last one, you know, we want to kind of go out on, you know, the best of everything that we can come up with, you know, the acting, everything. But then when it did so well, and it's like, you know what, what are we going to do? We killed him. Eh, didn't stop oh, us. A little, yeah, a little well, in the lake that suddenly becomes, you know, the elephant man in the forest. Um, you know, that was again, huge jump of logic, but it's like the way people think in the studio system, it's like, look, give them something that's going to be scary, scarier than a little kid. Um, but you know, the same thing when I did, uh, part six, I didn't skip part, you know, five, but I, cause I still said, you know, we got out of the institution and all that stuff. <clears throat> but I really didn't want to follow that path that Tommy was going to be Jason. as a lot of people thought. And, you know, and I, there was very little, you know, humor of the kind of humor that I think it needed. So I was just putting, I was going, look, it's a six one. Let's have fun with this thing. You know, let's make, you know, start with the James Bond thing, because that was the biggest franchise that we had going at that point. And I thought, make it be very obvious that, okay, here he comes, right? Just like Bond back for another one. So there was so many things like that, that, that really, I thought the fans were going to hate. I really did. I was scared to death how this was going to be received. Um, and it's only built over the years, oddly. But well, it's, it's one like, of the it's one of the most loved Friday the thirteenth movies. I mean, it's that's probably, because it wasn't it wasn't fake Jason. I mean, that's what they're always gonna say, you know, 
part five was the let me down the first let me down of the series i think because they had fake jason they wanted to bring tommy as something different and then you and then you know you get part six and you know it's it's no longer about that you know fake jason well i gotta tell you something you know quentin tarantino to my face said to me i love your work he named off everything that i've done it's like he's got a mind like a rolodex i mean it's oh, just incredible and he said but i'll be honest with you your movie was really great you know certainly early scream kind of thing but part five that's the best of the friday the 13th because it's pure grindhouse gritty you know nasty i mean that all the elements because obviously the you know the director you know came at it from a whole different perspective well um, i see what they were trying to get at you know mm -hmm. trying to do you know do away from away from jason and the Voorhees part of it except you know they would dress up as them i i understand where they were going with it well and they also substituted you know a lot more sex you know a lot you know more stuff that really i'll be right back they'll give it an edge right. i mean but I, yeah I, i'm gonna have to jump too because i got a movie i gotta see yeah uh before you go uh we have one other uh one final question uh uh tell me what was it like to direct a uh stephen king movie uh sometimes they come or sometimes they come is one of sometimes my favorite come back yeah yeah um it was a very mixed experience. <clears throat> um, there's a book that Joe Madri did on me called Some Folks Have a Strange Idea of Entertainment, Conversations with Tom McLaughlin, available on Amazon. This isn't a plug so I can make money. Don't make a cent <laughs> on it. But if you really want to see the path of a, how my life has been as a filmmaker and all the things that influence and stuff, it is a great record of that with a lot of photos because I always believe that you know, you want to see something, not necessarily have to read it. Uh, but in there, that's got the biggest chapter of all of them, because uh, just before I did that movie, my father was dying. My uh, Nancy was getting ready to give birth to my daughter. I had 40 episodes, you know, 20 for a thing that Nick Garris and I did called uh, She Wolf of London for Universal, and I was doing They Came From Outer Space, a comedy also for Universal that needed, you know, directors and writers and stuff. All that was happening. Then my best friend, Stephen Banks, had a live show that we were doing uh, for Fox and Disney called Stephen Banks Home Entertainment Center. And I was trying to prep a show that I was going to shoot in Kansas. So all of this stuff was leading up to that getting out of town. And you know, burying my father and holding my daughter. I mean, just there's so much emotion that was around it. So when we went in and the show was cursed, I mean, every day something bad happened, you know, but we kept going, it kept going and, you know, got it done. And once it, you know, it was kind of put together and Terry Palmieri, who did the, the, the score, brought this element of heart to it. It's now become probably one of my favorite movies as a representation of well, there's all parts of me in that thing, and I wasn't even conscious of it. But uh, Tim Matheson's character, my son always says, that's you, Dad. That's totally you. Your hair is cut the same as Tim. And again, it wasn't anything that either one of us were doing. But it sort of right. was like the thing that I, I escaped into and was like a mirror uh, in its own way of what was going on. And the cursed aspect, we were shooting on you know Indian burial ground which somebody came up at the end of the show and said, you're not supposed to be here, you know, you know, <laughs> and I go, yeah, we realized that, um, that tunnel scene was again, part of that whole kind of cursed train tracks that used to be there and, and things that happened in that tunnel. Um, and it, it was just a very unique experience and I'm happy with the end result. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen that movie. I'm gonna have to re watch it. All right, boys, I got to jump, you know, I got to right, go watch, go watch the film tonight. Let us know how it was. I will. Uh, we need to know, do we need to go see it or should we stay at home? Yeah, that's it. That's what we need to know. This, yeah. message, uh, this, this message was from uh, Sean uh, Lutis. His family says hi.
Oh, hey, how are you guys? Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. All right. So, Tommy, thank you so much. Uh, before you leave, shout out your where, where you want people to watch you, follow you, what you what you want them to check out from you. Well, I'm creating, you know, obviously a site for the for the new band, when, which you can hopefully see the Slot Villa. Part. Yep. Um, but going for much more of that, you know, monster sound, surprise, show band, lots of crazy stuff like I did with the Sloths see how far I can push, you know, bend the envelope. Um, so there will be a site for Swazilla, you know, soon. Um, but yeah, just, you know, Tommy McLaughlin, uh, com. you go to that and it'll take you to my Facebook um, because I had not figured out yet what I really wanted to, to, you know, be on that site. So I went, well, it seems like I'm putting everything in Instagram or Facebook. So mm -hmm. just lead, lead you over to that. Um, and if you just go on YouTube and put my name in, you'll see the band, you'll see all kinds of crazy stuff. And of course, Vengeance and Vengeance 2, you know, you should check out if you haven't. Um, I think that's it. Fantastic. Right. Tommy, thank you so much for your time. Right. Thank you for, it, it for allowing great. us to, to bend your ear and ask you a whole lot of questions. Oh, uh, great. We Absolutely. look forward to your next project for sure, because we're yes. super stoked on and not just Friday the 13th stuff, but I'd like to see what else you have in the works, because I know it's not just Friday the 13th. And I know that there's more stuff coming. So I'm ready. I mean, the weird thing is when I was doing that book and I hadn't thought about how many movies I had made or even anything about them, really, mm -hmm. I just kept going. You know, there's like, you know, 42 feature films that I've done that are everything from Santa Claus to angels to, uh, you know, mental illness to alcoholism to, I mean, all these real monsters, you know, in life, I, I was able to kind of tackle um, as well as obviously Freddie and Jason and Stephen King in the eighties. So it, it gives you a whole different kind of perspective on who are the bad guys, kind of like what Rob was saying is <laughs> us. If we let ourselves go down the wrong path. Oh, I agree. All right, guys, take care. Thank Have you so much, night. Tommy. See you soon. Thanks. Bye. Well, there you go, Mark. You got Mr. Tommy McLaughlin. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yes. No F. Yes. Uh, and you have fought like hell to get Tommy on the show. And, man, he is super amazing, exactly like you explained. Uh, I know you interviewed him before on a on another podcast that you were a part of, if you want to go ahead and shout that podcast out. Do I have to? Damn. Oh, the Jarvis podcast. Cool. Uh, it was you and Steven, and you guys absolutely killed it there, too. Um, hopefully, I did them just... I, I, listen, here's the thing. Horror is... Horror movies, not my genre thing. I watch them because Mark watches it, them. So. It, it's funny. It's not his thing, but we have them on here more than anything. A lot. It, it you know, th I think and, that 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 crew is the most humble crew too. I mean, it, it, and I'm not talking bad about any of our guests whatsoever. But man, these guys give us a lot of time. Uh, I don't know if they have to put in the effort, but they they definitely show up to the show. You know what I mean? Hey, Brian. Yeah. You know what we forgot to do? What we forgot to do? We forgot to say who the show was sponsored by this week. That was you. Yeah, I know. That's your fault. But that's that's who. If you're in Citrus County, that's who I would recommend to um, have come get or to. You know, yeah, shit. I can't speak today, God Somebody, if you need uh, your car or truck worked on, actually, he works on all motors. He can work on anything. Chris is great. He uh, was working on my daughter's vehicle. He came over here this past Sunday. Less than an hour, he had the gas line off and redone, and it was back going. And I would never have thought to do it the way he did it, and it was just he, – he's great. I've known Chris for a long time. Um, I don't really ask him to work on my vehicles because I, I try to do it, or at least I tried to. But then I got newer Mark vehicles. Mark sucks and at it. Yeah, blow me. And I, I got newer vehicles, so I have a garage to it. So they're all under warranty. But Chris was a great guy. If, if you're in Citrus County or around Citrus County, you need somebody, you know, I'll put it up again. Uh, his name's uh, Chris Smith. 
352-422-1907 for those who live in the county. Even if you don't live in the county and you're local-ish, does he travel? Well, he traveled to my house, so, I mean, I don't know. He lives next door to you, asshole. No, he lives about two miles down the road. (laughs) But, no, I've, I've known, like I said, I've known Chris for quite a long time, and he's a great guy. So we had a really good show tonight. We had uh, the one and only Mr. Tommy McLaughlin. Uh, Friday the 13th, part six is where you guys will know him as writer and director for that film. But check out Vengeance Bloodline, part two. Part one and two. Part one and two. And you can catch him there. Uh, Look for his uh, other feature films that he had out. Uh, He did. Sometimes they come back. That's he didn't mention a whole lot of them. Sometimes they come back is one that he did that was a Stephen King. Yes, he flip. talked about it. He talked about it when you so, were on here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, so, other than that, guys, uh, again, thank you, Mister Tommy McLaughlin. Uh, other than that, we have next week's show. No, we another. Don't. No, we we're don't. Not, we're not. I'm on sorry. Netflix. Mark Mark is gone next week, guys. So if anybody wants to come and co-host you don't, my you don't co- to, co-host you, my show, and we can do anything we want, you don't even know how to do this. I really don't. <laughs> I I know a guy though. Yeah, no. Uh, anyways, uh, well, speaking of Glick, don't we? Speaking owe him- of Glick and the nonsensical nonsense that he is up to he had asked us to be a part of a upcoming network and we told him tonight we would have an answer for him all right but listen i don't like breaking hearts unfortunately somebody broke my heart in a text i'm gonna do it live on screen so glick my answer unfortunately is that you have to put up with me in the nonsensical network if you intend on doing that because yes sir i will absolutely uh, be a part of that you have done such a good job with your shows and he has a ton of fucking shows correct yes, he's got he's, he's got nonsensical four, net- shows, four shows May yeah. caring for men on Mondays. Yes. On Wednesdays, he's got nonsense called nonsense. Yep. Uh, Fridays, every other Friday or twice he's a month. He's do doing doing uh, house. Glick's House of house music. music. And yep. then Saturdays, he's got the Open Door Challenge. And the, the Open Door Challenge. Uh, so if I become a part of the network, can I call it the Open Door Challenge? Because I'm tired of calling it the dare. Is that okay? You okay with that? Uh, so, guys, we are we are pushing forward into a new era. Uh, talking shit will remain talking shit. We're not going to change the show. We're not going to change our format. Um, in talking on, with in talking with Glick, uh, we don't have to. Um, we are just going to grow as a team. We're gonna we're gonna do everything we can to continue to grow talking shit. Um, and we're going to do everything we can to help the, uh, nonsensical network grow as well. So, um, hold on, wait a minute, Steven, you're already part of it. You cocksucker. You're already part of the network. Uh, so, so together, hold on. Did I, did I screw that up? Did I not tell uh, click? Did I, did you not ask him? The uh, <laughs> well, Mark Mark made this whole thing where he was like, well, "Yeah, I, I, I I put together this thing. What do you think? You want to play that now? Uh, we can. I mean, it, it's pointless. I, I like can. the intro to this thing. So so this is what I was this going with. A, I was like, absolutely, I like the intro. Uh, this is something I want to try to do um uh, with ours, but we're I'm still trying to work it all out. But we're gonna play this.
There you go. So, guys, stay tuned because there's a lot in the works. Uh, and if you're not already following Nonsensical Nonsense, you're fucking missing out, dude. Uh, anywhere you can find your podcast, anywhere you find us, they're right there, too. So yep. check them out. Nonsensical Network. Nonsensical Nonsense Podcast. Now, we're, uh, not, we're you, not sure when when this is all going to happen. I know it's going to be here. It's going to take some time. I yeah. mean, this is something that we're building, and uh, we're going to do it together step by step and uh we're we're in it to win it where we want to make uh the nonsensical network big we want it bigger i than... mean i mean he wouldn't take my my of you know i i tried telling him we should name it the talking nonsensical nonsense that's shit. way too that that's way too much i know but it sounded better oh <laughs> listen listen we are now on nsn <laughs> so you 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 used to follow me on CNN when I ran from the cops, but now, anyway, uh, something else coming up. Super excited about, and uh, they May they were second. talking about this. They were talking about this. Well, no, no, no. That's no, that's no. our show. But they yes. were talking about this last night on nonsensical nonsense. There is going to be a roast of the founder. And host Christopher Glick. When I is can't it? wait. I can't wait. Uh Glick, you want to post that up there? When's the uh when's the roast? Give him a second. Somebody will throw it up there, either him or, or Steven. We're super excited too, Bo. Uh that's why we wanted to talk the other day. Um, you know, it's as long as you're up to uh, listen, I got input but i'm not going to be a hands-on guy i'm just not going to do it dude uh, i Glick, think mark is going to be the guy already, that's going to be we already had our minds made up before that uh before that meeting we just wanted to hear what you had to say uh well i won't be part of the i'll be watching but i will not be part of that uh roast good i'm glad you'll be watching because i have been writing my ass off dude I'll i be, i have been studying day, for this roast that you understand day, I'll, I'll be in kansas so and it's my wife's birthday so i wouldn't be able to make it anyways if the house falls on you we will not be upset it won't be me underneath the house it'll be me <laughs> uh, never mind jarvis will say something never mind uh may 2nd on talking shit when you are back i'm super excited about this one because we do get the first opportunity to really work with nonsensical nonsense when we have invited the host glick to come on our show uh, our little okay. podcast uh, and have his have his input on our musical guest which is richie ramon get the, the fuck drummer. out of here the drummer get the fuck out of here richie ramon from the ramones bro let's say it bro get excited i'm stoked I'm stoked. How are you not stoked about this? I just wait until we have him on. Huh? It'll be different. Yeah, I'm gonna have a heart attack in this bedroom. I I can't wait, and I meant to have Tommy uh, say something, but I I'll, I'll reach out to him and see if he'll uh, make something for it. I think he uh, will because he he knows the band life. So here's he the also life. worked with Richie. See, things I didn't know, and we didn't bring it up in the show. It wasn't one of those things where I was ready to be like, oh, by the way. Well, I wanted to, I wanted it focused on Tommy at the time. I mean, but most of the time, right before they go to leave, um, or before even the show starts, a lot of times we ask them to see if that they'll willing to do this. Yes, Richie Ramon will be on. Uh, he'll be part of the uh, talking Mark, shit if you show. don't take the air out of your fucking... If you don't, if you yeah, don't did, stop did. pushing the air out of your fucking lungs. Yeah. Well, sometimes that happens. All right. So what else we got? Anything else? Mm, no, we're going to save the rest. Um, I'm not sure what we're doing for the seventh, but I, I know what we're doing for the or second, ninth, 11th. I, I, you know, the rest of May, I can tell you, but eh, we'll save it for the second. 
Perfect. We will see you guys back here. May 2nd. Talking shit on May 2nd. However, Mark will not be a part of the nonsensical nonsense show on the 27th. Seven. So if you want to come oh, I'll be watching. I'll if be you want to see me, bitch, you better be in the comments too. Yes, you know. I, 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 I'm telling you right now, I'm writing, I am writing my ass off. I plan on coming with guns loaded to this I, show. I'm, I'm sorry for all the dad jokes he makes. Whatever, I'm not. <laughs> Listen, we love you guys over at Nonsensical Nonsense, and we can't wait to work hand in hand together. We're going to make something big. Hopefully, we're going to make something big happen together. Uh, Mark, you got anything else? Mm, not that I'm aware of. Okay. It will be. Wait. I, I'm still saying you guys should have roasted Jarvis instead, but that's just me. But no, right, guys, I think that's it. From us here at Talking Shit, my name's Brian. And I'm Mark. Holy shit, you remember? Yeah, fuck so it. proud of you. <laughs> and we're out of here. Later. Bitch, I'm in the...